Hello, my name is Austin Habish, the founder of Think Catholic, your source for Catholic thought with both depth and devotion, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. Joining me is Claire Nowak. As today we continue... Come on, no, Claire, say hello. <laughs> okay, we'll keep it running. As today we continue our conversation from the last episode on God's existence by tackling the second of what's arguably the two most common objections to God's existence. The first is that we need not posit a God to explain existing things, change, etc., which we responded to definitively in our last episode, and then today's objection, the so-called problem of evil, which although it can be phrased in different ways, the gist of it, and probably one of the oldest written formulas of it, comes from Epicurus about 2,300 years ago. He wrote, Quote, is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then where does evil come from? End quote. Now, I doubt people today are likely to have this objection because they read Epicurus. So how does it get to the heart of contemporary man and what is the evidence for it? So I think it's really significant um, to point out that this problem has persisted for centuries. Uh, The question, why do good people suffer and why do bad people seem to flourish? In fact, in uh, bookending his arguments for the existence of God, these are the two, this is one of the two objections that St. Thomas brings up as an argument against the existence of God. Um, St. Thomas puts his argument... um, uh, based on the problem of evil in this way. He writes, It seems that God does not exist, because if one of two contraries be infinite, the other would be altogether destroyed. But the word God means that he is infinite goodness. If, therefore, God existed, there would be no evil discoverable. But there is evil in the world. Therefore, God does not exist. And then, of course, getting to the definitions eventually is very important. When we talk about the problem of evil... We all have some idea of what we're talking about, but it's important to start making some distinctions. Um, So two large categories of evil we would describe as physical evils. These would be um, natural disasters, sickness, stubbing your toe, um, all all of these kind of issues we run into because we are material beings in the world. And then, of course, moral evil, which is the sins committed by ourselves and the sins committed by other people. Um, everything from genocide to lying to one of your closest friends. But what is evil? What is it about those two things that makes it somehow the same? Um, So I think it's important to to start with framing evil as a deprivation, uh, a, a lack of something, some sort of a failure, an absence, a corruption, something being out of place. It does not have a positive nature. Um, Evil and good stand in a similar relationship to uh, light and darkness. So light, you can measure. Light is the presence of photons, the presence of waves. But darkness isn't actually the presence of anything. Darkness is real, but darkness is fundamentally an absence of something. Um, So that's a similar relationship to what good and evil have. Another example would be heat and cold. Um, If you actually talk about what heat means, heat is the presence of movement or energy in something. Um, Absolute zero is where all energy, all movement ceases. So you can't get colder than absolute zero. You can't get darker than total darkness. Um, But you can talk about heat. You can talk about light. You can talk about good as positive things. They're fundamentally coherent. Whereas evil, and we experience this when we encounter it in our own lives, is fundamentally incoherent. There's something unintelligible about evil because it's this kind of non-being. It doesn't make sense because it's sort of nothing. It's real, but it's the absence of something that should be there. Real insofar as it's corrupting real things, a real absence within things. The analogy is is perfect darkness in the room. And, And so... As we move forward in this problem of evil, as it strikes contemporary man, it may also be good to add a formulation given by those who contemporarily hold it as an objection to God. And Sam Harris, a very famous atheist and writer, 
This is what he says, uh, formulating the problem of evil. He states, quote, The problem of vindicating an omnipotent and omniscient God in the face of evil is insurmountable, end quote. And that's from his book, uh, The End of Faith. And I think it's remarkable and a little ironic that on this point, Harris is actually going to be refuted by his fellow atheists. So another atheist, his name is J.L. Mackey, uh, in Time Magazine in 1980, described him as perhaps the ablest of today's atheistic philosophers. And in his work titled The Miracle of Theism, which is against theism, and it defends atheism, and it'll favor, it'll conclude in favor of atheism. He has a chapter in there on the problem of evil, and this is what he's going to say. Quote, we cannot indeed take the problem of evil as a conclusive disproof of traditional theism. End quote. Now, why he thinks that is going to sound similar to the Catholic thought on the topic, so it's worth quoting, and so he's going to continue. This is what he says, quote, Let us call pain, suffering, disease, and the problem of evil and the like first-order evil. Distinct from this will be second-order good, which somehow emerges in an organic whole, a complex situation in which some first-order evil is a necessary component. Exactly how this emerges will vary from case to case. It may be simply the heightening of happiness by the contrast with misery, or it may include sympathy with suffering, heroism, and facing dangers. Since this defense is formally possible, and its principle involves no real abandonment of our ordinary view of the opposition between good and evil, we can concede that the problem of evil does not, after all, show that the central doctrines of theism are logically inconsistent. End quote. There we have it. And we have to appreciate intellectual honesty when we find it, even those who hold a contrary opinion. And just to round out the thought here, here is the Catholic thought on the topic as uh, given in the Catechism. This is paragraph 324. Quote, The fact that God permits physical and even moral evil is a mystery that God illuminates by His Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose to vanquish evil. Faith gives us the certainty that God would not permit an evil if he did not cause a good to come from that very evil by ways that we shall only know an eternal life, end quote. So those, those distinctions in goods that we have physical goods, we have moral goods, and within those goods, as we were speaking about what evil is as a privation, you can have privations on both fronts as well. So the privation of the good, the physical good of health would be illness or sickness, and the uh, privation of the moral good, a virtuous good of being temperate and prudent and just would be found in vice. And in both of these places, we can see greater goods or goods arising out of evils. And Aquinas will give an example of both on the physical side and then the moral side. He says, a lion would cease to live if there were no slaying of animals, and there would be no patience of the martyrs if there were no tyrannical persecution. So from the physical side, the evil of one animal eating another allows predators to even continue to exist. So the diversity we find in nature from the physical side, and then the moral side, without, well, I would say, without a tyranny or persecution, we would lose what Jesus calls the greatest act of love. Recall that Jesus will say that no man hath greater love than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And without the permission of evil, uh, specifically a tyrannical persecution, the world would lose that greatest act of love. And Gregory Lagrange will speak of the martyrs, and he will tie it with this problem of evil when he is asked, or when a priest he knows is asked that question of the problem of evil, why would God allow evils to uh, c- continue in the world. And, and this is what he says, or this is what he quotes the priest saying. They come to the priest and they ask, how is it that God permits such atrocities? And the priest replied, without persecution, there can be no martyrs, and the martyrs are the glory of the church. So on both fronts, the physical and the moral, we do see these goods that are coming out of these privations. And at the same time, we can still, we don't have to affirm 
the tyranny is a good thing. The tyranny is itself is still evil. Um, just because God brings about good from evil, we don't want to then think, well, the evil committed is good because great good was won by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. That doesn't mean that what the Romans did was a good thing. It was still evil. It was still incredibly evil. The horrible torture of the perfectly innocent man and God <laughs> is still a great evil. So how how does how does this work? How are we how are we talking about the good that is brought about from evil without kind of falling into this sort of consequentialism, saying that the ends justify the means? Um, part of that again lies in the definition of evil. Evil is a privation. Evil is a kind of nothingness, right? Which by definition cannot come from God, who is the source of all being. Um, but God, God is capable of bringing good about from evil because God alone can create something from nothing. God alone can create something from nothing. This is something that human beings cannot do. But God, by his nature, cannot be the source of evil. He permits it, and we can ask the question, why does God permit it? But God alone can bring good about from evil. And that question, Claire, we, we do tend to ask, so, so what are God's reasons for permitting evil and I think it's sometimes demanded of us as something that we have to be able to do to be able to give God's reasons for permitting evil to answer the objection against God that evil exists in the world and it's just not the case so we can show that evil's existence in the world no way contradicts God's goodness if he can bring good out of it but we don't need to take a step further and then try to go inside the divine mind and understand what, why God has permitted these particular evils in these particular places. And the example that comes to mind is, so I don't need to explain why, you know, Claire, if I can use you <laughs> as an example, I don't need to explain why you chose to teach theology to know both that you do in fact teach it and that there's no contradiction in you doing that and this podcast, for example, or actually existing so in the same way, I don't need to know why God chose to permit evil. I don't have to know God's reasons to know both that evil does exist in the world and that it does not contradict his goodness or power, again, provided that good can be drawn from it, as the atheist J.O. Mackey noted. And for him, that would be, it would be sufficient if that only meant sympathy or heroism. And I think it's also then um, important that we cannot fully explain the mystery of the problem of evil because we have such a limited scope. Um, that is that is one of the common objections um, brought up by the atheists is that um, for God to allow evils, he's got to have a morally sufficient reason. But the problem is we're asking we're asking for a morally sufficient reason, but we are not able to know it or to see it because our scope is limited so tremendously by space and time and our short lifespan. So we have to recognize we cannot see what God sees. Like God responds to Job in the book of Job, chapter 38. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And God continues in this, in this line of questioning Job, demonstrating in this kind of poetic way just the limited scope that human beings have. Again, because we are finite and we cannot even in theory expect to see and to know and to understand what God sees and knows and understands. And you're totally right. And the the analogy that comes to mind for for me is, uh, and I wonder if it was C.S. Lewis who gave this, but a dog watching a man reading surely has absolutely no idea wh why he's doing that or what he's doing at that moment. That but that doesn't mean that what the man is doing is intrinsically senseless or has no rationale behind it. And I think this is a good response to uh, someone who might say, well. I can see certain evils in which a good could be brought from them, but what about those evils that seem totally arbitrary and senseless? So a man's walking through the forest and a tree falls on him. Show me what is the good that's going to be drawn 
out of this. But again, the Catechism says we will know it fully on the other side. And as Claire, Claire and I are, are saying here, there is a sense in which we shouldn't expect to know the depth of intelligibility in things because of the distance between us and God, which is far vaster than the distance between my intellectual capacity and the dog's. And the mm-hmm. dog has no way of understanding why I do many of the things that I happen to do. And just with this particular example of the, the tree falling on the man, it could be, as it says in the, I believe it's the Book of Wisdom, that there was one who pleased God, was loved by him, and while living among sinners, he was taken up, lest evil change his understanding or deceive his soul. So there might be a sense in which God will take a man, he will live a short life, so that God might preserve his eternal life. But at the end of the day, again, to solve the problem of evil, we need not know the exact reason why God is permitting these particular evils. And we can see, we can gesture at least to some solutions. So why does God allow physical evils? Well, St. Thomas will say, well, God created a world of changing, growing, dynamic things. And in order to have that, you must necessarily, in order for things to grow, they must also die and decay. Um, For moral evil, moral evil is usually the kind of simpler one to answer. Where does moral evil come from? Well, it comes from human choice, from human free will. Um, Why does God allow human beings to do evil to each other? Well, because God allows us freedom, because God has made us in his image. And God, who is perfectly free, desires to to be loved by creatures capable of freely loving him. If there isn't freedom, then there isn't love. And that is the greatest good. Unfortunately, also with freedom comes the capacity to choose not to love God. If there wasn't a choice, it seems hard. uh, it, It seems difficult to say that a person is free. I've had students ask me before, well, why is it then? So God gives us free will, right? Why did we why can't he just stop people who are about to do something evil? Why can't he just snap them out of existence or kill them? Because then you're asking for a world where freedom is possible, but not the ability to exercise freedom. See, freedom is so important to the human person that it's, it's as essential to us as three sides are to a triangle. Freedom is necessary to be a person, to be made in the image of God without freedom. Like Austin was, was pointing out, uh, every act of love is impossible. Every everything, um, every good thing that a human being can do, all virtue is impossible without the ability to choose it. And we need not doubt that God can take even the uh, absolute worst uses of our voluntariness of free choice and turn it for good. And and that is what Jesus shows us that God that God is killed, and yet the good that would result from that, which is our in the end, our salvation. And so faced with this really insurmountable evidence of the good which can come from evil's permission, the objection against God really falls to shambles. And so instead of a very watertight, deductive, logical argument against God, what will happen is someone will backtrack to probability. So they'll say, okay, well, maybe evil in the world is is not a proof against God's existence, but maybe it does show that it's unlikely that God exists given evil in the world. But the thing about probabilities is they only hold weight in the absence of contrary proof. So, for example, it would be worth asking how likely or the probability it is that Claire, not to pick on you again, Claire, no, it's okay. <laughs> is, is sitting in front of me based on the time of day or whatever she happened to say in the past. So it is working. It is worth asking those questions and weighing the probabilities, unless, of course, my eyes and my ears are telling me right now, irrefutably, that she is, in fact, sitting in front of me. And then all talk about probabilities becomes totally irrelevant. And in the same way, in regard to God, since, as we showed in the last episode, there is conclusive proof for God's existence, then again, any talk about probabilities really just goes out the window. But what about this, what about the person who's in 
in the situation where they're they're dealing with tremendous evil. And I think it was so good to bring up the example of the crucifixion. What could be worse? What could be a worse thing than to horribly torture and kill a person who not only had never done anything, but by his very nature was all loving and all good? What could be worse than that? And yet that is that's the central symbol of our Catholic faith. The crucifix, the the image of the perfect man being not only subject to the the sin, like all, all human depravity, right? To to being mocked, to being falsely accused, to having his friends abandon him, all of these kind of moral evils, but also to suffer tremendous physical evil by being beaten and scourged and not given food or water and made to carry this heavy cross. What could be worse than that? And yet on the cross, the shocking answer, the shock, like we can look at God's answer to the problem of evil. The shocking answer is Christ on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I think it's so beautiful because very shortly after this in the book of Acts, you have St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church whose feast day is December 26th, right after Christmas as the first martyr of the church. And he almost verbatim repeats the words of Christ as he is being stoned to get to death outside of the walls of Jerusalem overseen by Saul and his prayer is for God to have mercy and to forgive the people who are actively killing him repeating what Christ did answering the problem of evil again with God's answer to the problem of evil and what happens right Saul is converted in this in this very very uh, shocking way and becomes one of the greatest of all Christians. So we see, right, like the, and of course that's not the only fruit of the crucifixion, um, but you see this kind of beautiful line through, um, from, from the gospels, but especially in the book of Acts, where you see the, the way that suffering, the way that injustice is offered up through the sacrifice of Christ, especially in the witness of St. Stephen, that allows for the grace of God to break in in such a dramatic fashion into the life of St. Paul. Claire, it seems to me as I'm hearing you speak that it's, we're almost saying that possibly the the better or maybe the, the best answers to the problem of evil are coming, or the best Christian answer to the problem of evil is the answer given by Christians who are actually suffering from evil, as you point out, a Jesus there, and I know we just celebrated Josephine Bakita's feast day, and just her story is so remarkable. She would be born in 1869 in Darfur, Sudan, and at the age of nine, she would be kidnapped by slave traders, she'll be beaten till she bled, and she'll be sold five times in the slave markets of Sudan. Now, eventually, she'll find herself working as a slave for the mother of the wife of a general. And there it says that, or she says that she will be flogged every day, uh, or she was flogged every day till she bled. And as a result of that, she bore 144 scars throughout her life. And so how does she reconcile her suffering with the gospel and with the God who she will eventually be preached to in 1882? So this is when she's 13. And and this is what she says, quote, I am definitely loved, and whatever happens to me, I am awaited by this love, and so my life is good, end quote. In other words, God knows what he's doing, and for this girl sold as a slave who is being flogged every night, she can truly look at the cross, she can look up, up at the sky and say, well, I know for certain that God is love, and he will work all this for his good purpose. Now, I think we can do more than just say that evil in the world does not contradict God. And what I mean by that is, I remember getting lunch with one of my old school teachers before Christmas this year, and I was telling her and her son about Think Catholic. I was writing on the problem of evil, and her son told me that his experience of evil in the world was actually what began his journey back to the church, which sounds kind of strange, but he was telling me that he had encountered what he took to be very real and very sinister evil, which made him think to himself, hmm, 
well, there, there must be going on something here in these people and in these actions than just atoms and synapses and quarks. And, and so he felt that he had encountered something which he just didn't think that the physics and the biology of these people could account for. And that made him think that there must be more to the world than physics and biology could account for. And so he started looking for some explanation beyond the material facts. And that would eventually bring him back to God. So more than just resolving the problem of evil, I think, as my school teacher's son thought, as St. Thomas thinks, that evil can actually be evidence for the immaterial and then even for God. And again, because what does evil mean apart from the good? It becomes, it becomes meaningless. If all the world were in darkness and there were no light, darkness wouldn't, we wouldn't have a word for it. Darkness wouldn't be anything because darkness is, darkness is just the absence of light. And evil understood by the same token, evil is just an absence where there ought to be something that is good, which then, interestingly enough, a lot of people will talk about evil like there's way more evil in the world than there is good. But when you have that understanding that evil is a lack of being, and then you look around at creation, at the world, you see there's a lot more being than non-being. Absolutely. (laughs) It becomes, you can't even compare the two because one is and the other is not. That's not to say it isn't a problem. Of course, it's the cause of all of the problems in our lives. But there there has to be more good by its very nature. And so that is that's one of the two, I think, arguments in which one can use evil actually as evidence for God. Claire, what what you're saying is uh, evil presupposes the good which admits evil explanation there must be an explanation for then this being or all of these beings in which this evil is housed in and boethius puts it in a small phrase this idea he says uh, one of these one of the disciples asked if god exists whence comes evil and he responded yet yeah, whence comes good if he exists not and that's what the entire the entirety of our last episode was going to show that if there is existing things, then there must be subsistent existence, which is causing it to exist at any moment. The second way I, I think one can see the existence of evil as actually evidence for God is going to be part of C.S. Lewis's conversion, but in, in a word, it goes something like this. Objective disorder or evil presupposes an ob- an objective order which it misses which presupposes an objective order er or some intelligent universal thing responsible for that order and in saint thomas's words i quote hereby we refute the error of those who said that there is no god through observing the presence of evil in the world on the contrary he should have argued if there is evil There is a God, for there would be no evil if the order of good were removed, the privation of which is evil, but there would be no such order if there were no God, end quote. Thus, the problem of evil becomes the proof of a universal and ordering intelligence. And and as I mentioned, this had an incredible impact on C.S. Lewis, who's a very acclaimed, well, he's passed now, but was a very acclaimed Christian writer, and his, his books are, are textbooks in a lot of places to this day. He will say in Mere Christianity, quote, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line, end quote. And so what C.S. Lewis is saying here is you can't call 1 plus 2 equals 5 objectively wrong unless there is an object of standard or rule, a table of sums, which it's just not in line with. It doesn't measure up to. So too, we can't call a person's actions objectively wrong or evil unless there is some object of rule or law which it doesn't measure up to. But you cannot have law without some law giver. And again, if the law is objective, meaning binding universally as part of the nature of things, then this law giver 
must be just as causally universal and at the level of a thing's nature. But to be the universal cause of nature and of things particular natures is exactly what we mean, what we mean when we talk about God. I think that's so great. And that reminds me so much of what um, Dr. Femister talked about last week when he was giving the argument from degrees of perfection. I mean, that's, you just, you spelled it out. Uh, It makes me think again of that definition, what is the good? And St. Thomas says, it's what perfects a thing. And you pointed this out, right? God as, as somehow causally in all things, giving them their nature. So what perfects a thing? Well, it's going to be God. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone wanted to escape this, so they hear this argument, it is possible that they could move backward and say, well, well, then maybe evil in the world is not something objective. It's just relative to a person's preferences or relative to a particular era. But if they do that, then they would also have to give up on the problem of evil as an objection to God. And C.S. Lewis, again, uh, points this out. Uh, here's him in Mere Christianity, quote, Of course, I could have just given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple, end quote. So those are the alternatives. Either one takes moral relativism and thereby drops evil as an argument against God or keeps objective evil as something very real, which then just becomes evidence for the existence of God. One sort of maybe ending thought that I have that I think um, has a much clearer practical application, when when bad things happen to us, especially when, when it involves another human being. Um, I, I've had this conversation, I'm sure many people listening have had this conversation on either side before, um, where a person becomes very angry with God for taking somebody from them. And certainly death is always a sorrow. It is always a sorrow when the soul and the body are disconnected, when we lose that kind of contact with somebody that we love. But we have to ask the question, and, and again, not when somebody is in the throes of grief. That is not the time to philosophize with them. That's a time to be with them, to bear their sorrows with them, and probably not to speak. Um, but when the time does come for discourse, for conversation, it, it does beg the question, if God is to be blamed for taking this person, then who is to be thanked for their being at all. Wonderful point. And furthermore, with that, if God is our good, if God is what perfects us, and God has endowed us with an immortal soul, then it, it changes the entire scope of suffering. Because this life at its lengthiest is a speck compared to infinity, is a speck confa- compared to eternity. If our soul will endure, and if our soul's true good is found in God, then death itself, even if you know our emotions, our hearts are still aching, we can put death in a completely different perspective because the person's greatest good is God. That person's greatest good is God. And so death itself can no longer, and most profoundly, of course, in the resurrection of Christ, where sin and death are firmly defeated. Um, but in, the, in light of the resurrection especially, death itself is not even close to the worst thing. In a saying, I remember a, a, a previous job, it w- we would say, on the day of victory, no fatigue is felt. And so on that day of eternity, even the worst and most painful life is not going to follow one there. In Sirach chapter 11, it'll say, in the day of prosperity, adversity is for, forgotten. And that is, that is the case. So having that eternal perspective. So the problem of evil, which points to the very real suffering, death and pain in this world as evidence against God, it cannot stand, provided as the atheist J.L. Mackey pointed out, it is possible for God 
to draw good out of evil. And that we see very commonplace in the compassion and generosity of those working with the sick or the homeless, the, in the past, historically, the heroism and the love of the martyrs under tyranny, and then even for us day to day, every small act of patience elicited in us by the burdens of life. And more than that, not only is the problem of evil not evidence against God, it could even be used as evidence for God, since objective evil, again, presupposes an object of order, which it distorts, which presupposes an object of universal order, and then in a second way, since evil is merely an absence in things, it leads us to ask, what is the ultimate cause of those things? which it is in, or anything at all, which, as we showed in the last episode, must be subsistent existence itself, namely God. Again, this is Think Catholic. My name is Austin Habish, along with Claire Nowak, and thanks again for joining us.